another episode of the Precinct Omega podcast, and I am delighted today to be joined by uh, not just a guest, but guests, in fact. We've got Nick and Rich from War Surge. If you've not heard about War Surge, it's a new miniatures war game coming out of Australia, and I sort of picked up on it on my social media feed a while ago, and it had some really interesting features that tap into stuff that I've been talking about on the Precinct Omega podcast for a while but without wanting to steal any of their thunder let me hand over straight away to introduce uh nick and rich from war surge say hello guys hey Hi. how's it going yeah, welcome so getting... yeah. that one's richard <laughs> <laughs> good point uh and it looks like everything is coming through nicely from australia we've got a very long distance call so to my uh whether it's listeners on the podcast or watchers on the youtube channel uh, my apologies if we get any technical hiccups along the way. I will edit them out as best I can as and when they occur. Uh, but I've asked Nick and Rich on to talk about War Surge. So to get us started, guys, please tell me, where did War Surge come from? What inspired you to write a miniatures war game? And why did that game end up being War Surge? Well, I think the initial sort of desire to create a universal miniature war game came about from our, our player group. We had a, a fairly decent sized um, 40K uh, group here in Little Warnable in Australia. <laughs> um, and yeah, we just had a whole lot of players that were starting to branch out into other game systems and a lot of other players not wanting to get on board with the new ones. And it just sort of created divisions um mm. between people and just yeah it wasn't fun for everybody so so this yeah, is like yeah. this is this is like a, a peace offering to the community is it to say here is a game that everybody can gather around and uh, bring whatever they want to the table well yeah. yes because I, I used to uh run a club just in a garage actually and we had um people playing with all kinds of different games but uh yeah warhammer forty thousand and uh fantasy and there were other games like uh infinity and a few mm -hmm. other ones but there were people would would come in with a, a game system and not be able to play it with everyone like uh someone would come in like oh does anyone else play this you know and everyone's like oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? so, so some obscure yeah group of models that they'd never heard of or and like oh the miniatures look yeah. great but too bad yeah. you know that's uh kind of what sort of got the cogs turning initially mm. and then there was people trying to proxy things in as well that just yeah it, it didn't feel right with the way that they were proxying and that kind of thing as well so we thought stuff it you know i reckon uh <laughs> i could do the math so uh i'll reverse engineer 13 different game systems create averages make a very big excel document and then uh design our own system so how long have you been working on this? Because, I mean, my impression from the website is, I mean, this is a very polished, good-looking, well-presented piece of uh, piece of design. So so how long has all of this taken you? Oh, thank you for that. That's quite nice. Um, there's <laughs> only three of us that have been working on it for about, well, two of us for six years, mm. uh, nearly six years. Um, and then mm. our oldest brother joined the project about... In the last two or three, was it? Nearly three years yeah. ago, hmm. yeah. So you guys are bros. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We are literal brothers. <laughs> and yeah, we've got one other brother that we keep in a basement doing coding. So yep. <laughs> bring out the gimp. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. But so um, six yeah. years of development. Uh, yep. It, take me through how that has looked for you in terms of sort of where you started, how you started getting things onto the tabletop. And, and at what point did you feel along that way that, that you had a, a polished game that was sort of ready for public consumption? Uh, only about a year ago, we actually went live. And that's when we finally went, you know what, this is actually a product that we could sell now. Hmm. Uh, before that, it, it sort of evolved from its origins was very, very basic. Um, I learned coding, computer coding, just to make the first two versions of the software. Um, and... Yeah, it just, it was very basic. Like, it looked mm. like something from Windows 98. Like, it was really just sort of like, oof. It predated um, the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but, that's what it looked like. But yeah. 
yeah and even like our rule system before it was very um very ordinary at the start we didn't have affiliates to begin with uh, now mm-hmm. we're affiliated with nearly 30 companies um and that's how we're allowed to get around the ip issue of using uh other people's miniatures um for our photos because we do not want any lawsuits <laughs> um ip is a hot topic for certain big companies at the moment um and we actually yeah like our earliest stuff we're like taking photos of other companies managers we're like i don't reckon we can use this stuff it's just yeah even though we were going to be releasing the rule book for free mm. it and digital it was just like no nah, we're, we're gonna hit so many issues if this actually got big um and yeah just got to cross each bridge as we got to it mm. and yeah the yeah once we had the affiliates uh we we're like okay now we need to up the uh the painting and the the photos and we just yeah had to go that next level up so yeah pretty much all of my free time for the last six well no because the painting only started probably about three years ago um yeah all i've been painting pretty much all my free time for the last three years <laughs> people don't, don't appreciate how long it takes to just create the painted miniatures to illustrate a set of rules yeah. it's uh it's incredibly time consuming when you you're also trying to do everything else around the game design Yes. Yeah, there's, there's so many things like sort of just grew all the different tasks that we had to do, like, you know, testing rules, uh, testing the app, you know, taking for, like the pictures of the miniatures is also another skill set that we mm-hmm. all sort of had to uh, be become aware of in that way. And yeah, it's just so many ways and different things we had to learn about. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it's a universal system where you can use any miniature, like that was a huge hurdle to get over in the first place. Originally, we had a size system mm-hmm. um, where you would say, okay, is the model bigger than so many millimeters and just go from there. And it had a certain criteria. But um, we actually, after lots and lots of play testing, we just figured we can make the stats do that for us without actually having to have um a model size limitation in there hmm. now that's really good i mean that, that's a, a, a i mean i've talked about this in my design episodes that you know the process of actually cutting away ideas fr- from a game is almost one of the most important parts of it but having that sort of that as you say that universality was was what i would call a foundational goal in my uh, in my design tutor series is you know one of those un unchangeable things you know that foundation on which you're you're building the game is it must be a universal system but then anything else can get cut away as unnecessary yep. so tell us then i mean you've talked about programming for the game and obviously i've done a, a little bit of due diligence so i know what's going on here but explain to those who may not have heard of war search before this video what is it about the game that actually requires you to have learned and taught yourself programming just to to play well just to build the game yep so really the the big sell point for war search is our app Mm -hmm. um the the app lets you design the profiles for your miniatures and it does all the point calculations for you um older systems used to do pen and paper um the maths behind our system would take anywhere from 50 to thousands of lines of math in order to get the the final number so yeah it all um changes live like if you just you change one statistic it changes mm. the whole unit mm. um the unit stats can affect weapon costs it depends on what you're doing to that uh our sort of special rule system is called perks so you might hear us talk about perks a fair bit right for the rest of it but um yeah, so certain unit perks can very heavily affect the cost of the weapons for that unit. Mm. So we can't really just pump out like, here's an armory with like every single different weapon you could possibly imagine. It's like, because it's going to cost very differently depending on what's using it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm. So that, and that that's really reminiscent of a couple of, of other games that I've come across doing something similar. Uh, Polyversal has a, has a website that has a unit builder that's very similar to that. Um, there's, in fact, Lee Gaddis, who I spoke to not long ago from Gaddis Gaming, his his system guards has an online unit builder that is quite similar. But that's all mm-hmm. just just web based. Rep, both of them have have got. I mean, they're good, solid pieces. In fact, even a Song of Blades and Heroes uh, from Ganesha Games has a, has a unit builder. But they're all quite old technology. Looking at the app, 
that you guys have produced. I mean, this is this is actually quite a slick piece of design. You know, I mean, it's artistically well presented. It's aesthetically, you know, really tapping in to the idea of a sci-fi fantasy kind of setting for your for your games. Are you guys also responsible for the aesthetic appearance of the app, or did you get some outside yep. help for that? That's all your uh, own work as well. Not all, like most of it is, um, but there is. Uh, we have uh, done some uh, paid uh, artists for certain works, right? Um, but we try and minimalize that because, quite frankly, we don't. You know, we're not driving a yacht on the, our lake just yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I know that been... thing. Yeah, art is <laughs> art is again. It's a little like miniatures painting takes longer than people realise. Commissioning art is is way more expensive than most people appreciate until they actually go talk to a professional artist. Yeah, mm-hmm. yep, for sure. And yeah, so it's all been self funded um, mm. by the three brothers. And yeah, it's just yeah, we've tried to limit the outgoings as much as possible. Um, yeah. And at this stage, we whatever money we do make goes straight back into marketing. So, so yeah. commercially speaking, this is this is how it from your because as a writer of of miniatures agnostic rules myself, you know I don't sell miniatures. I've often talked about how companies like Games Workshop, like Corvus Belly, like Privateer Press, their games are fundamentally marketing tools to sell miniatures. Yes, the you know the idea of the game is is to drive the sales of new miniatures. For companies like yours and mine, we don't make miniatures. So our interest is in obviously selling our rules. Now you sell your rule, well, you don't sell your rules. Your rules are available for free, but what people have to pay for is the app and the app is what you need in order to actually build an army in the game. Yep. So now you can actually try the app hundred percent for free. Mm -hmm. Um, There's just a limitation to the number of units you can create, the profiles you can make, as well as some of the features that actually cost us money to have. So uh, like the QR scanning feature. Right. So basically, if you have a, like, say you built a full army list, you could just say share army and then the little QR will pop up. Uh, mm. Or a text code if for some reason you wanted to say message it to someone mm. rather than them have to scan it. Um, and yeah, it will then populate the entire army that you've made just with the QR Fantastic. into their phone. Yeah. So, and that's a paid for yeah. feature. Of yeah. The, that's of a the, paid yeah. for one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, part, part of the, part of this podcast, this, this, or the YouTube series, whichever one people are looking at, um, isn't just, obviously I love promoting new games. I love pro- promoting new products, but I love trying to, to get insights into how people are monetizing the industry yeah. how they're making new commercial spaces and that's you know a fantastic really really interesting new commercial space to be building which is a supporting app for a game i think it's got a lot of potential for designers like myself that are always looking for ways to to leverage new ways to approach i think that's incredibly interesting so tell us then about i mean just the game experience what what is a game of war surge and, and I realize people, by the way, if you want to see this in detail, go to warsurge.com and have a look at the videos on there that are, I mean, again, I, I must find out from you guys what video editor you use because I love your videos. They, they look uh. really good, look really well produced, um, very slick, very clean, very clear. Um, I, I am uh, jealous and I want to learn uh, how you do it so I can make my videos much better. So we'll talk about that later, but go and have a look at those videos if you want it in detail. But just for those who who are just sort of picking up on War Surge and maybe aren't aren't yet sort of engaged to to want to make the effort to go and have a look, give my listeners and or viewers an insight into what a game of War Surge looks like, how it would play out very briefly. Oh, that can vary a lot, though, can't it? Really? Because uh, <laughs> well, that's the the part of a universal system, yeah. Yes, because um... uh, like you can have. Uh just before we get into any nitty gritties you like you can have a person with a single miniature as their whole army mm-hmm. like uh we had someone use uh one punch man from the nice. army, and he had him and i took an army with tanks and troops and he was just like regular punches and just flip a tank in one shot it's like oh you know and he he lost because the game was to collect, get objectives but of he course. had a blast because he was just using one guy he couldn't the way the mission went, he couldn't win, but he was just ripping everything apart. So he was just having a great time. But yes, uh, 
So with War Surge, I suppose what we have endeavoured for the table is that people can play it either with standard or advanced play styles. And what that does is it's kind of like skirmish or battles is kind of like what we're focusing on in that sense. But so uh, one player could take, say, an army of individual models mm-hmm. or take an entire table filled with tanks, hundreds of troops, you know, anything they want. Um, from a gameplay perspective, uh, if we were to look at the two different play styles, do you want to look at that now or do you want to... Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, uh, let, let's start with the basic game. I mean, it's... it's... Yep. You play a turn in a series of phases, if I've got that right. Yes. Yes. Yep. So, so take yeah, us through standard. the phases of the turn. Yep. yep. So standard plays um, with yeah the different phases. So each game turn has a deployment phase, a movement phase, an attack phase, and a dash phase. Right. Yep. So the <clears throat> dash is probably the only confusing one for people, which is just really like it's a kind of like running. It's kind of like a resetting up your unit's location ready for the next game turn. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I understand it, in the attack phase, the, the weapons you use in the attack phase will dictate whether you're going to have the opportunity to dash in the dash phase. Is that right? Yes. yes. So weapons have a type which is either assault, battle, or heavy. So mm-hmm. assault means that you've got free range of movement, so you can move and dash. Mm-hmm. Uh, battle, you can move, but then you can't dash if you use the battle weapon. And then if it's heavy, yeah, you've got to stay completely put um, mm. if you want to fire that thing. Yep. And in terms of combat resolution, it's, it's a D6 system. We um, do have I'd... a D10 conversion system. For oh, it. nice. Um, I was gonna say, I, I've often, been, I've yet, often accused but... D6s of being unimaginative. So, uh, <laughs> but, yep. but that, that's interesting that you've got the opportunity to sort of change out a different statistical variability for a different different dice system do both yeah. players have to use the same dice though in theory no well, like we recommend they we, did yes yeah. like, we, we, we say we, that in the d10 that you can uh, that we recommend that you use both um hmm. but what people can do is we also have a uh, what we call a mod so hmm. these are like optional rules you can put in your game where you can use D6 for some aspects and D10 for others. So it's like, oh, you know, I'm using two different kinds of dice, you know? Some <laughs> people like that extra complexity. Um, I'm usually not a fan of things that are overly complex, but some people just really love that stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. That will be me. Um, <laughs> so, but the D6 resolution system, in terms of combat, it's, you know, it's, it's a fairly familiar roll to hit, Roll to wound, roll to save, roll we to actually don't have a roll to right? hit. Um, okay. But like that—that that is actually an optional thing. Considering we wanted a universal system where people could represent anything from any other game system, mm. um, we have a perk system that incorporates uh, like adding a to hit to your attacks. Right. Uh, it obviously makes your weapons much cheaper. Mm. Um, mm. But yeah, that's totally up to you. And. Well, and yeah. that's the whole premise of with the game is that you can play it as simple or as intricate as you like because yeah. with the customization, if you take no perks, the game is really simple. It's just really you know, you're checking the power of the weapon against the defense, seeing if the AP you know can breach armor, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that's it. Whereas if you have perks, you can add, add abilities to recover health. You can, mm-hmm. you know, do all these special skills and teleport just, around table. Yep, uh, you know, traverse terrain, destroy terrain. You know, there's, yeah, literally, there's over three hundred perks. So, yeah, the customization of the app is humongous. Right. So, I mean, the reason, so what I was sort of pushing towards is that yep. that watching the basic gameplay video, a person could come away with the impression that. This is basically Warhammer 40,000 with alternating activation in the movement phase. So the standard does have a lot of similarities to 40K, but um, we like to think it runs smoother and fairer. (laughs) Um, We analyzed 40K really heavily because we played it for, what, 10 years? Yeah, Yeah. that's what actually got me in the hobby back in the day in the year 2000. Mm. Back when yep. I was at school and all when, that. When Y2K didn't destroy all the computers. You were um, all youngsters. <laughs> I thought we would have been about the same age. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anyhow, um, yeah, so standard, it does have a, a very 40K feel to it. Yeah. Um, at least older 40K. Um, because, yeah, that's what we grew up on um, and that's what we enjoyed. And then that's sort of inspired us to make a transition to because that's what most of our friends played. Mm. Um, so we thought, okay, well, how can we transition them smoothly without actually breaking you know, the system for them? Um, so, yeah, we uh, basically thought, well, what do we not like about 40K? And what do we do like about 40K? Mm -hmm. And just, yeah, sort of modeled our standard of what our dream 40K system would have been. Um, but then we uh, studied a lot of other things as well. Yeah, through the process of... Yeah, getting to where we are, we have looked at a lot of different systems. Mm. And yeah, then we decide, well, it's very limited, the tactical options in something like 40K or our standard. So we thought, okay, let's let's amp it up. But it's obviously going to be a more confusing system for people, a little bit more tactical nail biting happening. Yeah. Uh, so let's call it advanced. And yeah, it's that's the second play style we have which just lets people yeah, have that full tactical flexibility, uh, so which is tell us more, more unit. Yeah, you, you t tell us more about how, how advanced differs from the basic game. What does it add? What, so somebody who's sort of come away from the basic game thinking, ah, it just looks like 40K. What, what's going to grip them in the advanced game that's going to make them go, oh, right, this is, this is a bit more different. This is a bit more exciting. Tell me. Well, where standard is... Uh alternating phase by phase and players alternate activating units in that phase doing specifically what they're supposed to do they like mm -hmm. movement advanced completely breaks that sequence you pick a unit and you can do any two actions from a list of actions and it costs mm -hmm. points uh, mm -hmm. command points to perform the action and uh, what we've got going is that the more that you use a unit in this during the same turn the more points it costs to keep using it so it uh, to people that want to do like a cheerleading thing and have one guy doing everything, it's going to cost yeah, yeah. you a lot of tactical sort it's of points to do that. Usually very inefficient to do that unless you happen to have like a perfect weapon that cuts the armor and, you know, the perfect power to defense ratio uh, for someone else. It's usually not going to be very efficient to do the whole cheerleading system, which... But yeah. it's an option, you know. You can do it, but yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's well, usually exactly very inefficient. Guy, guy running Saitama as a, as a one-punch man, you know, yep. systems that just let you do stuff that's fun, regardless of whether it's efficient or, or necessarily going to win you the game, is, uh, is very appealing. Hmm. So the, are, the, are the perks something that's, that's part of both the basic and advanced, or do they only come yes. into play in the advanced game? They work in both. Yes. Right. Okay. And whenever there is a specific thing that advanced or standard has different, we put in on the the perks description saying in advanced games do this you know it's like because yeah. some of them originally were like okay in the deploy phase your model can now do this and then in advance there is no deploy phase so people would be like what the heck um but so every perk we have made a way for it to be used in advance that works similarly similarly for a tactical perspective hmm. um but it just yeah it won't be exactly the same right uh, now i a question has occurred to me, and, and for the benefit of, of my audience, I always try and chat to my guests before we start recording and give them a hint of what I'm going to ask so they can sort of prep themselves. This question has literally just leaped into my head. I have not prepped you guys for this. I'm, I'm yeah, sorry. Right. sorry. But right, what's just ready, occurred ready. to me? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if somebody is, is interested in War Surge, you've got this... App, this army building app in which they can tweak every stat they can add over 300 different perks and it's all gonna shift and change the points values of, of your miniature how do you prevent new players simply being overwhelmed with analysis paralysis we have example profiles in the the app which are hmm. fairly basic um and really unless you add lots and lots and lots of perks to a single unit you're not really going to feel too overwhelmed most people usually just add one or two special rules to get the feel of the model going and then on the other extreme we've had uh newcomers rock up and they like over customize 
it's actually gone the other way. Like I thought people yeah. were like, you know, oh, I'll just chuck that perk in and see what it's like. Instead, they're like yeah, filling out the whole perks. thing. I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> you know, it's like... Uh, but yeah, yeah. It's, it has been a challenge in a way um, because, yeah, it's just the there is a lot that you can do in this system. Um, we've got some fans who have developed a QR exchange system uh, mm-hmm. for the app. So people that are going from an existing system like 40k age of sigma or even dungeons and dragons um and then so they've got these models and they're like okay well i don't really want to reinvent the wheel i just want it to play the way it plays in that system um you know hook me up with a qr for my army and we've, we've they've got that like they, they've they've made that and they're adding to it slowly granted slowly, are there but, even you know, QR it's, codes it's amazing the, that they are are there even qr codes for individual miniatures uh, you, can you can do that. Yeah. So I could say, look, I, I just want to add a gelatinous cube to my army. Has any can anybody sort me out with a, a QR yeah, code yeah. for a gelatinous mm-hmm. cube? Yep. Save me the trouble, you know. Yeah, yeah cool. our Discord's pretty active, so I'm sure someone would do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, we're talking about a what you call a universal system, um, and I, I earlier before we started recording introduced you to the idea of the miniatures agnostic game as a as a term in wargaming and you know i i obviously write miniatures agnostic games um good example my my game horizon war zero dark which is a miniatures agnostic sci-fi game now even though it's miniatures agnostic it is a sci-fi game you know it, the the rules have robots it has hacking it has grenades and technology and lasers and all that good stuff so you couldn't just dump a dragon into it or a double-headed axe wielding barbarian or you know a tribe of orcs wouldn't work but in your design obviously in war surge it really is universal it's intended for for miniatures to be brought in not only for miniatures to be included from any kind of setting period or background but even for those things to be mixed and matched in a single army or pitted against each other with one side playing sci-fi and one side playing fantasy and it all sort of still gels together how does the game make sure that the feel of an army being one thing or the other is still retained by the play experience? Well, it comes down to the person who created the profile, really, for that regard. So Mm. if they wanted a dragon to support a sci-fi tank as their army... Um, they would need to take perks that sort of lean towards... So for the dragon, you might want to take perks that are associated with fire, like Hmm. um, our burn or ignite perks are very flame-feely sort of perks, Um, whereas the tank might take uh, the mode perk beam on its turret that's just this big laser that just punctures through, uh, you know, anything in that line of that turret. Um, so is it a little bit yeah. like, uh, is it like Clark's law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic so that, you know, spell casting is just sort of wrapped up in the same kind of mechanics as... as well, we've tried to be very generic and... with yeah wording for things for the perks so that, yeah, it doesn't matter whether it's sci-fi or fantasy. But, yeah, from a law perspective, like storytelling, that's mm. kind of up to the player in that sense, but we do have some law development going on which explains like if someone was an absolute law keeper and they just you know they have to have the story going well uh there is the uh, on the war search website a, a, a story section where we're going on about how uh basically that the universe is connected there's like rifts through time and space mm-hmm. and uh there's like even like suggestion of what happens in a physics perspective when uh an army or another world crosses into another so we've we've got that as a sort of like for people that are like wanting to get their head around it why their yeah. space trooper is fighting a dragon you know not yeah, that it, like you could have a dragon as an alien you know but they were yeah. very reminiscent of things like rifts or even even planeswalkers from magic the gathering it's not not totally uh off off their theme okay Cool. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, first, quick question about the app. So you've got 
this very slick, very good looking, very sophisticated app that does all of this complicated maths in the background for the players. But you are asking players to roll physical dice. Is there no dice roller in the app? There well. is a dice roller in the app. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so yes. in the play mode, uh, there's a tab at the top which just says dice, and you can literally roll 10,000 dice on it. I think it's, what, 9,999. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. We did have it go up into the billions, but um, it, it just it felt pointless. <laughs> yeah, as soon as you <laughs> hit, like, uh, yeah, it was like a trillion dice. It's like, boop. Yeah, it's the like, app just yeah, was just... like, uh, 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 and then it would just go, it closed. So, yeah. so it's, what you're saying to me is, is hardcore space orc players need not apply. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's even like re roll. Uh, you push re roll on the ones you want to re roll. If there's a perk that lets you re roll dice, and there's also a history button uh, no. so that, you know, if you see someone's like, Mashing the dice yeah, button, someone would be like, you know, "What are you yeah. doing there?" And you look at the history, and they've rolled tons of time. It tells the time and date and everything of when those dice were rolled. So if you see it within seconds, you're like, "Yeah, I'm pretty sure you didn't figure that out pretty quick and change things." So yeah, yeah, okay. The, uh, and then, uh, yeah, on on a completely different uh, twist, somebody mentioned at some point that in the advanced game you've got solo rules. Well, actually, it's. Uh, any play style, uh, standard or advanced, um, have solo. It's not so much solo rules as we have solo games and missions, like narratives. Ah, okay. How yeah. does that work then? Basically, uh, in our rules, we've got like a, a section talking about narratives. And mm -hmm. what that does is give people guidelines of what to expect in them. And it is that each book gives you like a set of instructions to follow sort of like what's the point limit you know what perks are there any perks that you're not allowed to use mm -hmm. and it puts all these guidelines and without trying to give too much away we tell people i'll oh, bring these models to the mission you it's know and play models it models that look a bit like this yeah so um, the yeah. idea is that then we have stages like stage one is you've arrived at the village you know and uh Stage two is this, and stage three is yeah, that. Fight broke out, blah, blah, blah. But um, from a uh, how it works perspective is that, uh, considering it's obviously one person playing against mm. themselves in a way, um, we have a, like a, a very basic AI system. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a few keywords that we have that are described in our narrative book as to, okay, so if the type is aggressive, the unit is always going to behave like this. Right. Um, yeah. And then we expand with the specifics for you know really detailed encounters. Like this boss monster, you know, you roll a D three to see what it does. Like if you roll a three, it'll go for the person at the, you know at the back, hmm. you know, yeah. of the party. Or they might even be okay. The the enemy has these weapons. With this weapon, it's always going to behave this way. With another weapon, it's always going to behave this way. So yeah, we've got plenty of variety in how we actually make that AI work. That's a, the, the keyword thing is interesting. It's a, it's a system that was also used um, by even Sorensen in uh, Five Parsecs from Home, which I, I, I interviewed him not long ago. And, and I really, uh, I really liked that idea. It was one of those ideas that I kind of went, oh, I, could, I definitely could have made use of that in one of my games as well. But uh, I, that's an idea for me to plunder in the future. But it's good to see you guys using that as well. Fantastic. Right. I'm, I'm getting through my uh, my questions very nicely and we've got some good stuff going on. Uh, so let's talk about the future of War Surge then. Um, what are the plans for it? What can people expect to see coming up in the future? And, and I know that you guys are, are now into a marketing push to try and raise awareness of War Surge. So tell us about what you've got on the horizon and, and where what people can look forward to. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So uh, where to start, really, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there's uh, a lot happening over uh, land down under, but. Um... Yeah, we've, uh, at the moment, we've actually just gotten enough uh, sort of requests in that we're like, okay, we're finally going to do a physical rule book. Uh, people still want to actually have something to physically hold, have on the table and yeah, reference the rules and look at the pretty pictures. Um, yeah, and we're, we're just natural hoarders, war games. We just <laughs> love stuff we can put in our hands. Yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, I've been contacting a lot of uh, book uh, printing companies uh just in the last week actually and yeah the it's it's definitely going to happen it's uh just a 
a matter of when. We'll probably be doing a Kickstarter for it, uh, just so that we don't buy 10,000 copies and only sell yeah. 10. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, keep uh, eyes peeled for that one. And on the actual gameplay front. Yeah, we've uh, got plans or we're working on a tournament system and a campaign system. So Fantastic. It's, expansion. I mean, I can see, and from everything you've said already, I could see that, that the game is being geared towards being a tournament-friendly experience. You know, it's quite a tightly controlled thing. The fact that everything is digital means you've, you've got good records. It can be easily, easily shared with tournament organisers and, and fellow players. So is, yeah. there, is there enough interest and excitement locally that you might be able to get a... a tournament going in in your own scene uh yeah we'll definitely be getting tournaments happening in uh victoria the state of victoria um it's just well once uh covid uh well the once, yeah, and, our premier yeah. dan andrews is uh very keen to uh keep everyone locked inside their houses um so yeah as soon as that's no longer a problem uh, then yeah, we'll be definitely hitting the uh, a tournament uh, campaign s- sort of yeah track where we'll uh, yeah get people testing a tournament system with us. Uh, it'll still be using our like core rules because mm-hmm. uh, yeah, as you mentioned, we've it sort of feels that way already. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we've done a lot with regards to balance. Balance is really important to us, and yeah, we really always wanted to do some kind of form of tournament and just still to have it like a balanced fun tournament system. It's mm. the dream. <laughs> and you talked but, also about a, a, a campaigns. Now yep. you look at something like infinity. I know you've been mentioned is played locally. I don't know if you've looked at infinity as a model, their infinity tournament system isn't very dissimilar from a campaign system in that you have, you know, thematic uh, missions that change each season along a, a very broad theme. Are you looking at doing something similar? Well, with the campaigns, like as a ex, sort of like an expansion slash material for people to use with War Surge, we would be introducing missions and probably encouraging people to create their own four mm-hmm. campaigns. But what we'll also be doing is giving like management tools, I suppose, for say making map campaigns, uh, managing resources beyond the immediate battlefield, mm-hmm. kind of like going for the big picture, like almost like sort of empire building in a sense is kind of what we want people to be able to have the option of. And that would come into tournament as well in that, okay, say we had a set campaign system um, where it was like, okay, you you know, attack a defender, run through four different scenarios, um, that could easily be used as a tournament um, mm. campaign. Like It just depends on yeah. how many games that people want to play. Uh, if they just wanted a classic, okay, can you beat them up? We've got the deathmatch mission type, which, yeah, there's no worries with that. Uh, but, yeah, people do like the longer campaign systems. So we're just trying to meet every need that we can for the miniature wargamers. But we will also look at the narratives as well, not just for single-player campaigns, but also because we've got some interesting competitive games like we made one called Basket Brawl, and that is a basketball-inspired, like, I don't sports know, game. Arena. sports <laughs> miniature game. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, you we might have a campaign based on building a team up, right, and going right into the finals or something, you know. And you might have you could even do it with the tournament. It's like people have mm. got their their teams of players and you're just working up through the tree kind of thing. Yeah, so oh, fantastic! That sounds. Mm. I, I mean, I, yeah, I hadn't come across your basket brawl idea. That you know, the dread ball meets blood bowl meets guild ball, all in in. You know, you get people who've still got teams from those but aren't playing can can get their teams together and play a completely different game. No, that exactly. sounds that sounds really interesting. I like the sound of that. Fantastic. Okay, now last last question, and this isn't really anything to do with War Surge. It's just kind of something that occurred to me when I was prepping for your interview because I I know that the miniatures wargaming scene in Australia is is very healthy, is very active. There's there's a lot of really interesting stuff coming out from australia in in miniatures designs and painting and hobby content but i was racking my brains and i couldn't think of any other 
games, miniatures war games, that had been designed in Australia. I thought, well, we got Flames of War from Battlefront in New Zealand, but in the larger part of the Antipodes, I, I was coming up blank. Are there... Oh, no, I, ah, I literally, I've just thought of one. There is, of course, there is... Um, ah, what are they called? Um, Bot Wars from Trade from. Trader's Galaxy. That's the other one which I am aware of. But it is a little bit of a, a design yeah, desert. There, are, are you aware of any other local games yes, that there, I, I should there is. have been made aware of? Well, I don't know if you should have been made aware of it, but um, there was a company, I think, in Sydney that was, uh, I think it was called Juggernaut. Yeah, uh, some, yeah, and yeah. they teamed so, up. But they yeah. got so far through their development and then uh, CreatureCaster actually purchased the rights to their system. Oh, um, and oh, their okay. models. Um, so they're yeah. working together now. Which so is Canadian. Can- I think Creature yes, Casters in Canada, they isn't are. it? Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah. So two Commonwealth countries yep. <laughs> working together. <laughs> yes. The English speaking domination of tabletop wargaming continues. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, but other than that, it's like there's been lots of. Like, I think this is probably even a worldwide thing where people try and do like homebrew systems, mm. and then they go, you know what, I could, we could sell this. Um, and there's been a lot of those that have tried in Australia, but um, they you haven't heard of them, bro, because they don't get up there. Um, and they usually are very homebrew sort of looking. Like, yeah. Um, like if we had have launched three years ago, it would have mm. just looked like another homebrew system. Um, but then we spent you know, another three years making it looking look really polished um, and just, yeah, really knuckled down on the math and just got to really try and aim for that balance. Yeah, like yeah. I remember seeing some on the local scene, and I mean local, I mean Australia, uh, and some of the homebrew stuff just looked like it would have been done in a... Uh, do you call it noughties, the, the decade where it's a 2000 to <laughs> 2010? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Early um, millennial, yeah. It, yeah, it looked yeah. like early millennial Word documents. Yeah. It's kind of like, it just looked like they'd just used, you know, sort of like preset, you know, uh, fonts and things. And mm. it was just like, I really want to like it, but it just looks like my mate down the road made it. Mm. You know, that's... And it's not, there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, everyone's got to start somewhere and do something to make something happen. But um, it, I guess it's just the difference between when when it's, you're playing at a club, if someone comes in with a Word document printed thing and then someone's got a rule book of another game, it sort of doesn't have as much appeal, I suppose. Mm. But yeah, it just seems to be one of those things. The wargaming industry isn't as big in Australia as it is in the UK. Mm. Um, or in the US. Like, or, yeah, statistically even the US where... We're growing into the geek culture, I guess, as a nation. Um, we were all born geeks in this family. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, but uh, horrific childhood experiences. But, um, yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, it's one of those things. It's a growing culture in Australia, as far as I know. Um, we're on the increase for war gamers, But, yeah, because I think when we got started in it, in a town of about 30,000 people, there was probably only about 15 people that played miniature wargaming. Mm. Yeah. Which you had Who to were find them. to admit it in public. They're like, yes, yeah, well, handshakes. I think even mm. probably five of those wouldn't admit it in public. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's only just the, you know, the uh, roll out of the car past um, our house into the garage to play. Uh, so no one could see them going in. But um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's 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 a growing culture, which is exciting for Australia. But um, well, it was growing before COVID. I think that's probably kicked it square in the the boin loins. But um, yeah, it'll grow again. I'm sure <laughs> it will. I'm sure. I'm sure. Right, Brill. Um, I, I there was something else that occurred to me, but it's completely gone out of my head. So I'll not worry about that now. It clearly wasn't important. Um, I mean, I've I've sort of powered through my questions. I've got a really good insight, and, and I've learned a few things and and taken some lessons away from from what you're doing that looks really very exciting indeed i remember what it was i remember yep, what it was great. let me I'll ask you this so <laughs> okay. again this is this is something which has just sort of kind of popped into my head so so forgive me now one of the things that i would guess you're not interested in is miniatures you might be surprised um Commercial. miniatures okay i, I would um, guess that you're not interested in producing miniatures alongside the game we 
we don't want to step on the toes of our affiliates. Um, they've been very good to us. Uh, we, we have dabbled in the thought of it um, simply because we would like to make more money. Um, <laughs> you know, at the moment, we're all working other jobs. Um, this is literally just a labor of love at this point. Um, Side gig. So, <laughs> yeah, so we, we do want that it can support at least the three of us to work on it full time. Um, and yeah, so when we were doing that, we were like, when we were weighing up our options, one of the things was like, well, there's other groups that do similar, like very basic universal systems, but they sell you know, STL files for 3D printed models and they're making great money. And it's like, hmm, you know, like, should we be doing that? But then it comes down to like, yeah, our affiliates, like they've been very good to us. We don't want to sort of be like, yeah, focusing on our models if we ever did make them instead of them. But I would say though, that if we were to produce a starter box, yeah, uh, we would seriously look at either producing our own miniatures or perhaps doing a deal with our affiliates to have them featured. It would be like almost a crossover in that sense, but we would look at it that at the time, uh, once the physical rule book is done, we will then look at like, it has that. been very tempting. I do dabble in 3d modeling. Um, I was, uh, a drafts person, which is sort of like a poorly paid architect in Australia. Um, and so I've done 3d modeling through that. Um, and then I, yeah, I've done a few little models here and there for, for fun before we actually got, um, affiliates, we were going to design our own miniatures, uh, just to be able to have miniatures in the rule book. There's a lot of people when we were talking about it, cause we've got, uh, friends and family into the hobby and they're like, all right, so what miniatures are you going to put with it? You know, cause that's all the, they were into is just like, you know, adding to their plastic crack collection so uh we're like well uh you see and then we'd have to yeah you know so it's one of those big maybes in the future if we have to find another way to generate extra revenue but we're hoping to not just because we would rather focus on delivering the a quality rules. game like we yeah. yeah we'd rather spend our whole time just making the best quality miniature war game that we can make also, um, shipping physical things to and from Australia is just like the biggest pain in the backside. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we're pretty far away. <laughs> yeah. What I was um, thinking, what, what was occurring to me was uh, I was something... The leader in this market, although it's far from the only one, is Hero Forge, which is the ability yep. to customise your own miniatures. And it occurred to me that, that there could be some kind of potential to have your long list of perks and weapons associated with specific designs within a miniature building pro you know uh, platform like hero forge so as you build a character it could offer you war surge character options that are appropriate to the selection of war gear and skills and even poses that you've ascribed to a miniature yeah, it wouldn't be hard for us to have uh, pre-generated profiles that so they say, okay, you know, this is a magical looking sword, recommended profile, you know, something exactly. like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that would be quite easy. Um, I have actually talked to Hero Forge uh, once before, um, ah. but that was purely to ask them about their three D printer because mm. I was just, yeah, I was astounded at the quality that they could print. I was just like, what is your printer? That's amazing. Um, and it was not cheap. <laughs> no, no, um, sadly, I, sadly, they, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. All these, all these beautiful desktop printers that are running at five hundred dollars and and less, that they're, they're great. But when you want that real quality, you're, you're getting into four figures plus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and no, I think theirs was around a uh, oh, one hundred and twenty grand US or wow. something. It was, yeah, it was really expensive for them. Um, so. Yeah, everyone go support them. They obviously need more money because they've, <laughs> they've spent, outlaid a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, we haven't spent a hundred grand yet on anything. So um, yeah, but um, yeah, well, yeah. So models, it's it's a big question mark. It's yeah, we would like to not, but we'll we'll see. <laughs> but there is like the whole presets thing. There is um, yeah, we mentioned before about the QR exchange website, mm -hmm. the fan one, and 
you know, it, it, it's just like that. We could, you know, have more presets there for people. But uh, what's made the presets difficult is that often people move very quickly from those and start doing their own wacky, wonderful characters. And uh, of course. and yeah, it's uh, it's been very interesting looking at what people actually design and produce. And sometimes I've seen people actually make the profile and then, then they're actually making their army come to life. And yeah, once like, there's a tournament scene, you know, the, the min-maxing activity will will peak, certainly, of people trying to work out what is what is the perfect combination of skills and styles. And hopefully the answer will be, well, it will depend on the player. It'll be whatever yeah. skills and styles and perks suit the way you play the game. Yep. Which is yeah, the like, ideal I... outcome for a designer. I've put a request out in the past to people to try and make OP things. Um, so far, we've had people say, like, it feels a little bit too strong, like one or two things. And then we look at it and go, yeah, maybe, maybe. So, like, yeah. recently we yeah changed a core stat slightly. Um, and that was just based on player feedback. Where, yeah. um, well, and then we did more testing ourselves after we got that feedback. But, yeah, we, we're in this constant cycle of just trying to tweak it so that yeah it is more and more balanced. and not do anything too drastic when we do it like sometimes when people adjust rules in games uh it's often swing too far the other way and then it becomes a dead thing and we're like we don't want that we want sort of everything to be viable within reason yeah. so um like yeah you just we're just trying to get it that people can do what they like and it's still competitive mm. Mm. Like even the people that want to recreate the face huggers from Alien, and they go up and implant the enemy unit, and then when they die, an alien comes out. Yep. You can do that. You can yep. do that without nice. rules. <laughs> right. Very good. Okay, and it's That'll point costed, so you can make it a relatively balanced army. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. Right. I, uh, despite having these random things popping into my head, I have managed to exhaust <laughs> all of all of my questions for our conversation. Is there anything else that you guys would like to communicate to my audience about War Surge that we haven't had a chance to touch upon? Well, is... uh, probably the narrative system we probably didn't touch on too much. Um, they're all free to download too. So. Mm. Um, yeah, it's and that's where all the solo content is. So for all those people that are locked away, like, well, there's probably not too many as locked up as what we are at the moment. But um, yeah, just if you got no one else to play with right now, we have solo games. And yeah, just go to the website, www. No, no one does that anymore, do they? Just warsearch.com. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you can find everything there. But there's also team ones as well. Yeah. Like co-op. Yeah. We've got some co-op ones. Yeah. Um, but it's only one there, but we're about to, we're in the process of finishing off another co-op one, which is massive. Yeah. The Den it's, of Dread. It's about a 50 page document. So. Oh, fantastic. And, um, yeah, all free. And if so. you play it on digital, like there's, or whether you play it physical, it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in it. There's oh. like maps, there's a world map to go through kind of thing. And there's boss monsters and random encounters and, uh, yeah, and there's challenges at the end of it as well. So, like, if you beat it once, it's like, all right, beat it like this. Achievements, achievements. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I've got, I've got achievements in mind as well. Although I never, oh, never made nice. really good ones. So, uh, one thing which I, I definitely haven't asked you, which we definitely should say, is if people have been inspired now and they want to go and get the War Surge app, obviously they, they can find lots of information at warsurge.com. But yep. where can they download the app? Is it Play Store, iStore? What, what's the? Well, yeah. What's the um, there's links on the website, but you can also uh -huh. search, uh, if you've got an Android phone, it's the Google Play Store. You just search yep. for War Surge. And on the iPhone, it's the Apple Store. Fantastic. So is so, it all, all the usual places? Yep. Um, for people's clarity, because if they just typed in War Surge, it would actually come up with two different apps. Uh, uh -huh. One of them has a blue icon, and that's the subscription version. So that's the free one to try. And then if you enjoy it, it's a dollar a month. Um, and then we have the yellow or gold icon, which is the lifetime subscription, which is a one-off purchase of mm -hmm. 20 US dollars. And right. then, yeah, you get all the updates, everything for free yeah. well, for, from then on. It's yeah, just that yeah. one purchase. Yeah. Mm. So if you're going to play for more than two years, then yeah, yeah, you're 
probably better off with the lifetime. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably go and get that one. Awesome. Well, I, I am definitely going to try and find some time in my schedule over the next few weeks, between now and Christmas, to, to download the app and get War Surge on the table and maybe even make a video of, of what that looks like and share that with my audience so that we can, can see what the experience looks like. Be it's been it's, absolutely fantastic ooh, to meet you guys. Here's one, oh, go on. One, no, Rich has got something question. to share. I got a question yes, for you, actually. Oh, if go you... on. Um, so <laughs> is there an army or anything in your collection that you would look at and go, actually, I think I would bring that to the table? Yes. I'll go and get it. <laughs> Hold on. Awesome. I've, I've wanted an excuse to get this on the table for a long time, uh, and none of my games actually suited. So uh, this is my excuse, not only to get this on the table, but actually finish painting it, because it's not quite <laughs> finished. Ah. This is my, my Dreamforge Leviathan. No longer in print, sadly, no longer in, in publication, but it was, uh, it was produced. It was a Kickstarter campaign some while ago, but I actually... Uh, got this direct from the from the manufacturer while he was still in business, and uh, as I say, it's nearly finished. But I've never quite finished painting it because I've never had an excuse to get it on the table. So I am definitely <laughs> looking forward to statting this baby up for war surge. Yeah, yep. Yeah. You have to let us know how how it goes. That that looks like a very impressive model. <laughs> I think, well, that's yeah, awesome. Just, just him against everything else in my collection could be funny. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Possibly I'll, I'll put him up against a dragon. I've got a couple of dragons I could put on the tabletop as well. I'll have some fun with that. That'd be awesome. There we go. Beautiful. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Fantastic. Mm. Thank you very much for coming, guys. I appreciate that. I will, uh, I'll wrap up the recording and, uh, and obviously I'll put all the links in the comments underneath the video and in the Podbean uh, version of the podcast. At, uh, hang around. We'll chat after I've uh, finish the recording. Okay, so thank you very much for coming, guys, and uh, I'll speak to you again soon. If you enjoyed this content, please consider supporting Precinct Omega via Patreon for behind the scenes, early access, and exclusive extra videos and vlogs, or help keep the show on the road and get great new games from Precinct Omega at Wargame.com.